welcome to Lincoln Theater. Thank you all so much for being here. My name is Christina Belknap, and I am the executive director here. And it has been a number of years since we've had the opportunity to welcome folks here for a Talking Art in Maine event. And I am really excited that we are getting to do that tonight. I wanted to take a quick moment and just thank the sponsors of this program who have generously donated so that we are able to provide this program free to the community. Uh, that is Damariscotta Hardware, the Damariscotta River Grill, where we just had an absolutely delicious dinner, uh, Hammond Lumber, and also the Knickerbocker Group. So please support the businesses that support the arts and make this type of thing possible. I am thrilled to be welcoming a brand new host this evening. Uh, this is her first event with us and we are so thrilled. Please join me in welcoming to the stage our host, Emily Sabino. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Hi. <laughs> Where is David? I'm coming. You might as well come on out, too. David Esty, everybody. So, Talking Art in Maine is back. Um, I'm your host, as you know, Emily Sabino. I'm an abstract representational painter living in Newcastle, and I have the distinct pleasure of spending the next hour with all of you and with esteemed painter David Esty right here at the Lincoln Theater. Uh, before I introduce David to you, uh, I wanted to give a shout out to former Talking Art and Main host Jane Damon. <laughs> As you all know, uh, Talking Art in Maine was actually her brainchild and something she took great care to create, curate, and cultivate alongside Andrew Fenneman and Damon Liebert and uh, now Christina Belknap. So a warm round of applause for Jane in the theater. Woohoo! <laughs> so just two more things and then we'll dive right in. Um, if you came a little early, you may have noticed there was some music playing um, and that was Enor sonic wallpaper, uh, Ollie Liu, a local singer-songwriter, and The Flying Seeds. So, um, yay! <laughs> and finally, if you were out in the lobby milling around, you may have noticed some beautiful artwork there that looks surprisingly like some of these uh, works here. That's uh, David's artwork, and we just thought it would be nice for you guys to have a chance to see it live if you're here tonight, which you are. So um, feel free to enjoy it at the conclusion of the event. Uh, and if you have questions, we'd love to answer them in the Q&A uh, following the talk. So just hold your questions and we'll get to as many of them as we can uh, when the talk concludes. So uh, now I would like to introduce all of you to the wonderful David Esty. Um, I met David through the Union of Maine Visual Artists. Uh, how many here are members of UMVA? Yeah, a few of you. Well, for those of you who don't know, um, UMVA is a statewide network of over 400 artists, art lovers, and patrons in Maine, and they do a lot of really cool stuff for those of you who love the arts. Um, so definitely check them out, and we'll probably talk a little bit about that uh, during, during this uh, talk. But anyway, uh, David's been the president of UMVA for a few years now, and in the process of being involved with it, um, I had the pleasure of visiting David and his wife, Karen, who's also here tonight, um, and seeing many of his drawings and paintings from his extensive collection. And I do mean extensive. He has produced over 10,800 pieces of art. Yeah. <laughs> uh, he's an improvisational painter, and we'll get into that, what that means. Um, and he's living in Belfast with his wife, Karen. And he was born in 1942 in Fort Fair Fairfield, which is really way high up at the tippy top of Maine. So uh, there was an art school then, so he taught himself to draw and paint, I would say mostly in a realistic style to start, right? Yep. Mm -hmm. And then he went on to earn a BFA in painting from RISD. 
Then he got drafted into the army, and when I think of getting drafted into the army, I think, oh, going and fighting somewhere or peeling potatoes like my dad did. Uh, but no, he was actually an illustrator in the army. So he spent four years at Fort Meade in Maryland illustrating like the um, posters and different things. Um, and after that, he uh, was wandered around parts of Europe. And um, he, let's see, I've lost my place. Um, Oh, he, he got a degree, a master's degree from George Washington U and had a federal career in public affairs, which I think we would now call marketing and communications. Mm. Is that about right? Fair enough. Fair enough, okay. <laughs> but all the while he was studying art, creating art, and teaching art, so it was always close at, by his side. And he's been in 24 solo shows and over 100 group and juried exhibits. His work is in private and organizational collections in 20 states and seven countries. His main roots and extensive study and experiences outside of Maine have earned him hard-won depth, beauty, and gravitas that we will be able to enjoy in his work tonight. So David Esty, welcome to Talking Art Maine. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so let's start with this image here, which is called Hamilton. Uh, it's 16 inches by 18 inches. It's an oil on panel, and it's an homage to your RISD instructor, Robert Hamilton, who was also uh, an improvisational painter. So uh, why don't you tell us what improvis improvisational painting means to you? Well, it's basically um, just starting out um, working on a canvas or a panel and just seeing what happens. You could start out with a color scheme. You could start out with certain um, um, implements, uh, brushes, sticks, whatever, and um, just kind of go with the flow. And maybe an idea or a narrative thing will happen, and, and maybe you'll just be uh, just dealing with the colors and the lines and the spaces, and maybe that's enough. Sometimes it is. Yeah, and um, Robert Hamilton told you that the most important thing about his work that kept him going was the element of surprise. Exactly. And that's a, what I think you're trying to do in improvisation. It's, it's very liberating in that if you don't have, uh, if you don't start out with something that you're demanding of yourself in terms of uh, subject or narrative or even some design, then it gets to be play instead of work. If you get too hung up on a particular goal, although that's great discipline and many artists work that way, uh, I find that it's not as much fun and you don't, you're not apt to run into so many surprises. And, and that's what I think most improvisational painters are doing. They're looking for the surprise. That's cool. So let's, if I can do this correctly, let's see here, there we go. Let's move on to this totally cool image that's called Alter Ego. Um, this is on um, Yupo paper. So first, let's get that out of the way. What is Yupo paper and why do you like it? Well, it's called a, a synthetic paper, Japanese, but it's actually um, a thin, fairly thin paper uh, coated with plastic on both sides, which means that when you paint on it with a, some kind of water-based uh, paint or oil, anything that's liquid, it, it doesn't sink in, so therefore the sheet doesn't warp which is why I like it, it stays flat. And how did this particular image come to you? Well, I, I think I was just using a spatula and uh, paper towels and water-based uh, acrylic paint and just kind of fudging around on the paper and then it started to be a person. And the more I did it, the more it began to be sort of like me because my hair <laughs> used to be even more wilder and um, and then I, I, I put a kind of a split suit on the person, which is, of course, what I wore every day at work as a bureaucrat. So I named it Alter Ego. And so maybe it's me, maybe it's not. So um, can you talk about how you title your works in general? This one I, was obvious, but how do you go about that? Well, it's, it's the last thing that I do. And oftentimes a, a, a title doesn't come to me. So. It remains untitled for some time, but um, <clears throat> what happens is oftentimes some kind of narrative starts forming, and, and that's as much a surprise as anything, and it sort of leads me someplace, and in the end, it suggests something to me. It, it reminds me of something, 
some place I've been, something I knew, and usually a title comes pretty clear to me. And, and the thing about a title to me is <clears throat> it's something that I'll always remember. M of all these pieces I've done, I'm starting to lose it now, but, but for a long time, as soon as I spoke the title, I knew what that piece was. So the title has two functions. It sort of gives a hint to the audience, maybe what I was doing. Um, but for me, it often is what triggers that image in my mind immediately. So it makes it very memorable. All right. Whoops. I've got to go the right direction here. This one is called Brainchild, and it was uh, from 2017, and it's actually a revised painting. Um, so part of your practice is going back to paintings and reworking them, including paintings that have actually been shown in galleries before. Yeah. So what sparks your desire to rework a painting? Well, if my wife says, if things stick around, especially something she likes, she's afraid it's going to change. <laughs> and it often does. Now, that might be because I haven't matured to the point where I finished something the first time. But uh, I don't worry about that. I think it's, um, I, I continue to look at the things. And um, if, if there's something I wasn't quite satisfied with, but I was willing to let it go into an exhibit, later on I might see something to say, I know what that needs, or I know what it wants to be. And I'm not um, wedded to any particular result, so I may pick it up and change it, thinking, now I made it better, and it pleases me more. Hmm. And do you find it easier to start a new painting or rework an older one? Definitely easier to do, uh, redo an old one, because yeah. like anything else, if you're a musician, a writer, anybody has to create something, I think you know that it's a lot easier to fix some, somebody else's work or even your own, than it is to start from scratch and create something. So, you know, painters and writers and musicians have this block oftentimes. And one of the things about improvisation is I really don't have any blocks because I don't have any expectations in that direction. So it doesn't matter to me what happens, and I just hope that in the end I find something that I really, really like. So you don't get that like sort of blank slate like ah, when you look at uh, something that's just white sometimes? Not anymore. I mean, yeah. it can be still scary. I mean, something beautiful and white and pristine is nice. And it used to be very scary where you could sit and doodle and play music or read or do anything but face that. But I, I don't do that anymore because I, I allow myself not to, um, not to care or to fail. I, I really don't care. Huh. How'd you, how'd, you, how'd you figure that out? It's strange. It came to me all in one weekend. I, was, um, I had a very dear friend, Harold Gard, who passed away a year ago. Very accomplished painter. Lived to be 99, almost 100. And uh, I just love his work. I think of him as Maine's Matisse uh, because he worked the same way. Uh, he had a lot of narrative imagery in his work, but he started out just doing stuff. And... Um, and I uh, was trying to paint a tribute to Harold, and I had two different uh, paintings going, both with his image in them. And I invited him down to my basement to see what I was doing. And he saw them, and of course, like any egotistical artist, he was drawn to that and wanted to know what I was doing. And I said, I'm working on a tribute to you, but I'm trying to do it in your style, and I'm not you. So it's difficult. So he said to me, um, want me to tell you what I think is a problem with the way you're working? And I said, sure. He said, are you sure? I said, yeah, 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 I, I want to know. And he said, I think sometimes you let the narrative stand in your way of making a better painting. Oh. And at the same time, I was up at the Hutchinson Center that weekend giving a talk about my work, and it was a a little old woman about five feet tall who just created all kinds of paintings, never had any training, didn't really know how to work, but I knew a lot about art because she read a lot. And um, at the end of my talk, she came up to me and said to me, well, I, I see your influences and I see how you love de Kooning, but I want to know who you are. And I said, what do you mean? She said, well, I want to know who you are as a painter. I see all these influences. And I said, 
no, the last couple paintings I was trying to say, this is where I'm going. And she said, no, that's not the question. My question is, who are you? And so I said, why don't you come over to my studio and see? So she came over, she went through the whole house. I had paintings on the wall that inspired me because of some little thing in them. And she said, you gotta take all this stuff off the wall. Just start from scratch. And this painting here, one which I happen to really like, she said, That's, that painting is you. It happened to be a political statement about Iraq, the Iraq war. And um, so I was quite put out with her thinking, but uh, I, I thought a lot about that and I said, you know, she's saying the same thing Harold is saying. She told me, just take a piece of plain canvas or paper or whatever and start painting, see what happens. So I had bought some of this Yupo and hadn't tried it, so I decided to try it. And I, I said, I don't have the guts to do it in color. I'll just go black and white, which I grew up with. So uh, I liked the first result. So I tossed it on the floor and I made another one. And I was using big, big brushes, sticks, putty knives, and um, just having fun. And by the end of the day, I had a half a dozen on the floor and I liked them. So the next day I did more and I did that for about two weeks and then went into color. But that process, um, uh, I think happened because I said to myself, hey, you've been making all this stuff, you've been dragging it around the galleries and then dragging it back home again and, you know, framing all this stuff. And I had stepped away from that a little bit. So I thought, I'm going to stay out of that and I'm just going to paint like I did as a kid. And that, so that's what I did. I started painting in, on Yupo and I was thinking about what they had said to me and I allowed myself to fail because I really didn't care. I might do something where you say, wow, that's great. But then the next day, I'd look at it and say, what the hell was I thinking? <laughs> and paint over it and didn't care. Didn't matter, I didn't own any gallery, anything, and I didn't expect to make any money. And so I thought, let's just have fun. And I've been doing that for at least a dozen years that way. That's really cool. Mm. So the narrative doesn't lead you so strongly anymore. If it bubbles up, woohoo, but you just go until you right. feel it's done. But I, I am amazed at sometimes what narratives happen. Yeah. Uh, things that are in your head. And I don't try to figure out, you know, analyze myself. I don't try to, f I don't have to know what everything is. But on the other hand, if I do something and somebody says, uh, that's a, um, you know, some kind of sexual symbol, or that reminds me of some kind of uh, piece of brutal brutality or something. I don't like that. I, d I don't want to do paintings like that. And I don't want a an overly sexual content if it's so obvious and, 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 and it offends people. So I, I might take that out. But otherwise, I really don't try to figure out, I don't have to know about all of these things. And once in a while, I figure out later. Like, oh, that's what that was about. Hmm. One more question about this particular painting. Yeah. Uh, when you're doing re uh, revision of paintings, you're, you're putting lots of layers of paint on top and you end up with these really rich colors. Yeah. Uh, can you just talk about your approach to layering colors? Well, you know, as I said, I grew up in, with black and white, you know, magazines, books, uh, television. So I love black and white, but because of that, and because my, the only artist I really knew much about was Norman Rockwell when I was a kid, uh, he was my hero. And Norman Rockwell was not known to be, you know, some great creative painter. He was a great storyteller and a wonderful illustrator. And now I think he probably has come into his own. And he really deserved a lot more credit than he got in terms of painting. But because of that teaching myself, I didn't know anything about color. I didn't know anything about mixing color. You may have a piece here in, in, in the end that shows what I did do with color. But, um, but lately, lately, people have said to me, hey, you're a great colorist. And I'm beginning to think I am a pretty good colorist. Yeah, you and are. One of the things is that I put color over color. Yeah. And I love to, uh, if I'm going to paint over a mistake, I might as well see if I can do something with it. So I like to see if there's something that can come through that might give some gravitas to what I'm doing. And um, so that's why some of that happens. So this one 
is called Kim Jong Un. Yeah. <laughs> it's from 2013, and um, I find humor in this particular painting. Did you mean for it to be humorous? Yeah, I did. And, okay. um, and I tried to figure out uh, some kind of symbolism for the two bars in the front. And I've never figured that out. I just like them. I just like it that way. But the image that came up in the back, as soon as I saw it, I thought, oh, that's Kim. And of course, he was in the news then, and there was all this talk about what he was doing with North Korea. And uh, I just I thought it was too good to paint over. Yeah, no, it's great. I, I saw the blue uh, rectangles kind of as like his pants or something that went up above <laughs> his chin. Yeah. Um, but another thing I noticed about this painting um, was just how good the design is on it. You know, you have uh, the horizontal rectangles above Kim Jong Un's head, uh, and it's kind of like a repeating pattern with what I think is his hair up there. Mm -hmm. And you just, it's a really well put together painting. Uh, so can you talk to us about how your background in illustration and design informs your work? Well, as, as she said, I went to the Rhode Island School of Design, and it was the first time that I, I understood anything about what you ought to know about art, what about about color, about design. I discovered the abstract expressionist, and I never got over William de Kooning. William de Kooning, outside of Picasso, is probably my, my grand hero. And um, it, it's totally different, of course, from Norman Rockwell. But since then, I, um, I, I just find much more surprise and gratification from things that aren't locked down and have a, a, a strong narrative. But uh, so I hope having graduated from Rhode Island School of Design that I've learned something about design. So design is very important to me. In fact, that's what I'm about. That's what I'm doing. I'm, I'm playing with the elements and principles of design. And um, uh, I, I'll tell you something Robert Hamilton said to me one time, which is exactly how I feel about it. Uh, he said, um, he gave me a, a drawing and I knew better than to ask, but I asked him anyway, what is this about? And he said, well, you and I know it's all about design, but hell, you gotta give them something. <laughs> so we had a very, very uh, funny cartoon narrative to it. Okay, this one is called Icon, and it was from 2020, um, acrylic on canvas. It's three feet by three feet, so a little bit bigger than some of the other ones. I know it's hard to tell size when we're looking at slides. Um, this is another reworked painting. So was, uh, how'd you come up with the name Icon for this one? Well, I, I didn't start out with any title, as I said before, and I was just playing with textures. I think that part at the top that might be maybe hair or something is a piece of um, um, handmade paper that had a lot of texture and a lot of um, fiber going through it. And I, I liked the look of that, and I picked out some colors I thought would work with that, that I found in it. And I was just making designs. And, um, and then began to take shape as some kind of being. And it, saw, it looked like a very important being. I thought of it as a sculpture first. And then, and I did a braid, I think, down the side. Yeah, you did. I love to do braids, but I, I never figured out how braids go together, but I love to see a woman with a braid. So I have paintings with braids in them. And this one had a braid, but it seemed like a really important little figure. And it seemed to me so important that it should be an icon. Makes sense. I like the planet eyes, too. That's, they looked like planets to me, the yeah, eyeballs. Yeah, I thought about that, too. And I played with a larger one there to make it look like a planet and maybe space. Right. Huh. OK, this one is actually hanging out in the hallway, so you all can check this one out after, after the talk. Uh, this is called Sisterhood. And it looks to me kind of like two women with orange veils that are hugging. Mm. Um, that. Yeah, that, I, I was explaining this to my, my two remaining sisters. I had three in one pass, all younger than me, but two are out from Florida right now. So I showed them that the other day and tried to explain it to them. So I have two sisters left. And um, one of them pointed out that that reddish, the reddish fig yep. piece is almost exactly the same shape as what I had in the, the one we started out with, the Hamilton, as like a little fez. Yeah. 
And, and I had not noticed that, that I had taken that and flipped it on its end and used it in that painting. But I was, again, playing with the shapes and the colors and, and having a good time. And then it seemed to be two figures. And they seemed to be kind of stuck together and hugging one another. And I got thinking about my two sisters in Florida who were down there and still one another. They're very close. We're all close. But um, I, I thought about them and I named the painting Sisterhood because of that. Oh. It is two figures hugging. One has actually got her arm around the other. Right. You can see the little, the hand. Yeah. Whoops. I was going to point to the hand, but then I, the clicker did something else. <laughs> this one, this beautiful painting is called Handyman, and you donated this one to Lights Out Gallery. Um, mm -hmm. Shout out to Lights Out Gallery. Um, and let's see here. Can you talk a bit about the tools and techniques you get to, uh, that you use to get varied surfaces? Because you can see all the different surface things going on in this one. Yeah, well, some of it is that overlapping that uh, I was talking about. And, and sometimes I put a, um, a thickener in the paint to make it oh. pasty so I can get some texture and I can use a palette knife. And I, I like to have a variety. I don't think I've ever done a painting completed with a palette knife with um, consistent texture. I like a variety of things. And um, as I did this thing and kept working it, it seemed to have a wire sneaking through. And then I had some teeth and some some uh, kind of saw shapes and the more I thought about it the more it seemed to be like a workman's bench and a workman's tools and the kind of thing that a, a man might do have around the house to fix things. I'm probably thinking about myself as the older I get the worse I get as a handyman. <laughs> I'm now smart enough to know that I'm probably going to have to call somebody in to do that right. So I, 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 I call them in sooner rather than later but I'm thinking of myself not being such a great handyman anymore, but maybe those are about the tools that a handyman uses. So I like the play of the textures and the, 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 the lightest gray there, I must have painted that over four or five times to get the Just texture and to get the light to come through it without being too dominant, too bright. Yeah, you... Um you do really well getting certain colors to kind of jump out. I notice that's another, another uh, aspect of your work that is very cool. Mm, thank you. Yeah. I don't know if I know what I'm doing, but it does happen sometimes. <laughs> All right, let's move on to this beautiful painting. This is called Sketchbook Entry. Uh, it's 30 inches by 40 inches. It's acrylic on canvas. And you did this one in 2018. And you had commented that this was more of an aesthetic painterly work. And I would agree with that. Um, there's so many cool things. It's got this sort of southwestern color scheme going on, mm -hmm. at least to me. Um, and I just, I wondered if this painting was inspired by the tables and notebooks in your studio. Well, in a way it was, because that little gray, light gray, uh, shape there that's almost some kind of little being or a head or something was something that was in one of my sketchbooks and I've been doing life drawings one the reason I have so much work is I I've been doing life drawings uh, most of my life and either once or twice a week like I'm going to Waterfall Arts right now twice a week and um, so one of my sketchbooks had this and I like to abstract the figures so that I can get some new shapes that nobody's ever seen before or I haven't and I found this little shape in one of the sketchbooks, and I really liked it. And I had this big canvas, and I needed to start with something, so I decided to re reproduce that little shape. And so it came right out of my notebooks or sketchbook. And then um, I started playing with a spiral idea, and then a piece of a tabletop. And I thought, and maybe, maybe a hint of a chair, top of a chair back there, but, but I thought, I really like these shapes. They're simple and not very many of them. And I have to quit on this thing before I ruin it. So <laughs> it seemed to me like that painting went together very quickly. It had the little sketch I really loved and it came out pretty well in the painting. And it gave me a title. And I thought, um, it just looks like a painting. No matter what else it is, it's, it's a piece of shapes and colors put together and it's, it's good enough for that reason alone. So it's one of my favorites. Other people don't seem to understand what I'm doing there, but 
I, I think, think it's care. beautiful. Yeah. So um, how do you figure out when to stop? I know you go back and rework certain things, uh, but what's your stop uh, method? Great question, hard to answer. <laughs> um, I think I stop when I can't figure out how to make it better. And so I might stop and just put it aside for a while and come back and then maybe finish. Or I might, um, uh, I might stop too soon. Or I might stop too late. And I had a painting that, I have a book I put out a couple years ago and I have an illustration in there of a painting that took me 18 years to do. And Karen knows the first time I had it in a gallery was in Philadelphia. And then we moved to North Carolina and I had it in another gallery in a different iteration. And we came back to Maine and I had it in a gallery in Rockport, painted over again, and still wasn't satisfied. So then I decided I'll take a picture of it, put it in the computer, and I'll paint it on the computer. So I did that and did several uh, versions of it on the computer. And I saw that this is not going anywhere. So I took the painting out and painted it once more and really liked it. And it, it, I had a lot less in it. I painted over and had some things still coming through. And I was happy with it. But then the next day I decided I can simplify that and make it even better. And I finally did what I think is a finished painting and I've had it in a couple of galleries since. So it took me 18 years to get to where I wanted to be. But some people in seeing the pictures I took of it said I should have stopped one back. <laughs> <laughs> you mentioned Karen, so what has her influence on your art been? Well, Karen didn't really know that much about art when we got together, but she's learned a lot now, and she's picked up a whole lot more than I realized. And she'll make <laughs> little comments and, um, and, and say, she's, she's very, very uh, supportive. Mm -hmm. Always coming in saying, oh, I really like that one, or oh, that's great, or something. But, and she also says, I'm not going to tell you because you'll paint over it. Or <laughs> I don't want to point out what that looks like because I know you don't want to know. But she's, uh, she's, she brings uh, reality mm -hmm. to what I'm doing. And that's very valuable. Not only the, the support, anything I do is great, okay with her, which is pretty darn good. That's amazing. Okay, this one here is called Still Life Reflection. Um, it was a reworked painting um, from 2018 that was originally called Alhambra. Did I say that right? Alhambra? Mm -hmm. Alhambra. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, to me, this is, if I had to, whoop, that thing is loud. If I had to uh, title this myself, I might call it the levitating cup or the non-still still life because there's so much going on in this painting. Yeah, well, I, I don't care about doing still lives and I don't paint flowers much. I've done it, but it doesn't do anything for me and I'm not that good at it. So I was doing this big painting and I, and I was really taken with a color scheme that I had going. And, you know, I liked things about like Renaissance colors and Rembrandt and all that kind of stuff. So this seemed to have some of that flavor. And I had some prior to this, maybe some, um, some design elements to remind me of uh, 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 some time I spent in Morocco, a couple of weeks, and uh, all that kind of beautiful architecture and um, design. And so that's why Alhambra, but in Spain and Morocco. But then I kept painting on it, and eventually, from what might have been shadows of some still life stuff I was thinking of, I began to paint my own shadow or myself in it, almost like a mirror image oh. in the back there. So I decided to change the title of it. But here I was having a good time playing with linear elements and uh, shapes and the, the design scheme. And some things, yeah, started to float off the surface. And I can't explain what they're supposed to be doing, but it still was a still life to me. So, so that's why the title. Mm -hmm. Okay, this one is called Summer Place. Um, it looks like it's on, is it on Upo? Yeah. Yeah, I figured. Okay, yeah. so 18 by 24, that's the um, dimensions. And it's acrylic and graphite. 
Yeah. And um, you want to talk about size, if you have a preferred size when you paint? Well, I do a lot of 18 by 24 because uh, Yupo, Yupo comes in um, 20 by 26. And I figure if I tape off with frog tape around the outside, whatever mess I make, it'll look better, better when I take the tape off. So that's the way I work. And so I have a lot of that. You can get it larger, and you can, I got it in a roll one time. But um, so I like to work on a uh, drawing board in front of me. And if I go bigger than that, rather than use my big easel, I like to paint with it on the floor so I can walk around it and turn it or see it from different directions. So sometimes it's, sometimes people say, oh, I wish you'd turn it up this way. But I, I, I feel, as a lot of painters do, that there's a certain gravity that should take effect. And paintings usually have one way they're meant to be because gravity is kind of telling you it needs to be that way. But this one, um, it w I was just playing with big, wide putty knives and swiping across with color and, and experimenting with things and overlapping the color. And I think that the white is just the Yupo. I left it plain. Mm -hmm. And it, it seems to be very fresh. And the colors are fairly thin because I'm scraping them off. As I'm doing that, I'm scraping them off mostly. And um, so it just seemed to have a um, summery, vacation-y, almost like I, th I was thinking of it as a, J a Japanese area with a, the mountain, mountain and snow, Fuji. Kilimanjaro in the it, background. It, yeah. it, it had that feel for me. So that's, so you might not feel that way, but I know from that name, I'll remember what that is. Right. So this question, actually, uh, I was talking with my mom and uh, she said, do you consider yourself more of an intellectual or emotionally driven artist or uh, maybe a physical artist, like when the ideas and forms bubble up? Do they come more out of your head or your heart or, or just straight out of your hands? And that's, that's hard to determine. I, I would say I'm not an intellectual painter. I, I think a lot about it and read a lot about it. And I read a lot about and think a lot about politics, actually. That's my other passion. But they don't mix very well. Um, <laughs> but um, I think I'm, uh, I like organic shapes, and I think I'm working much from the heart. And yet I know so much, maybe I know too much. One of the instructors at the Fine Arts Academy in Philly told me one time, your problem is you know too much. And that, there's something to that, that if you have your head full of stuff, uh, then and all these rules and things, then then it, it can be uh, it can be limiting. But I think in the end, I uh, I think it comes from my gut feeling that this is what I want and this makes me feel good and this is funny to me, or um, you know this is the way these things have to be. And if I don't quite understand uh, the, the whole thing or can't quite explain it, it's okay. Hmm. Okay, this one, I love the title of this one, Timeshare. Ah. This is from 2015, it's 18 by 24, and let's talk about uh, color again here. Uh, I was appreciating the differences in hue here. You've got like on the left, you have the sort of more um, uh, turquoisey blue, and then kind of to the right, it's, it's more of a greenish blue. Yeah, well, I don't know. I think that I, <clears throat> I like the, the, those colors that went together. And, um, and I, you can see just by the architectural look of that, that I'm drawing, I'm dragging a certain kind of uh, size spatula across. And uh, they're crossing one another. And then I'm leaving it very, very thick in a couple of places there in the orange. Uh, but I have to tell you, in terms of the, the title, I have a timeshare condominium in Ocean City, Maryland. And a couple of times I was down there, they were building more, and they were putting them on stilts. And uh, so I was doing little sketches in my sketchbook while they were constructing them. And um, so I was thinking of that when I was doing this painting. I thought, that's what this wants to be. Ocean City, Maryland, you know, water, sand, uh, this thing on stilts. And I thought, I'll make a little deck out there, like as all mine. So I made a little deck and a little um, railing. And when I was standing back across the room looking at it, I thought, 
it looks like a Hamilton painting. It looks like a funny little guy with two eyes, a face. And, and they are actually, the eyes are the windows. And it looks like a face smoking a cigarette. So I decided, yeah, I like that. So I left that and kept it kind of, you're looking into the thing and you're in, looking into a, a room, into the condo, and you're looking through a room on the other side with that window, but it's a strange little creature smoking a cigarette, which is why the little cloudy thing's there. So it's two things. It's a building, it's a condo, it's a, it's a Hamilton face. Yeah. Now you guys are going to be looking at buildings differently after this, because a lot of buildings have windows that look like eyes and a mouth. So, <laughs> okay, let's move along to Gendarme. Yeah, this is a favorite of mine. Um, I, that title is, of course, a French policeman. And when I was doing this thing with shapes and having a good time, and here the textures and the, uh, the nuances of the black and the grays, were so much fun to me. I just love that. Again, because it's black and white and it reminds me of a drawing. There's a lot of drawing in it. So here I feel like I've got my drawing and painting together. For years I thought my paintings are nothing like my drawings. And that bothered me. Drawing was faster, uh, more fun, uh, more spontaneous. And drawings started to get to be ponderous, started to get to be problems that you had to solve. But this thing, to me, it, it it reminds me of being in Paris for a short time. It reminds me of the French uh, uh, policeman that had that kind of strange hat, and they often had a little mustache like that, that guy on the right. I hope yeah. you see a figure there. And then on the left, I've got kind of like nude, maybe a, a nude or a couple of Picasso-esque nudes, like there behind this Frenchman. He's got the cape, the typical cape, like a French or English would have in the bad weather. But I traded this with uh, the owner of my uh, gallery, um, Studio 53, in uh, Booth Bay. He had a painting that was worth twice as much as my price, but I loved it, so he traded even. I was thrilled about it. <laughs> then, that was a year ago. This year, no, it was two years ago. Last year I said to him, I was having a show there again, I said, is there anything in this show you'd really like to have that I could give you so that I can get that one back? Sure, he says, that one right there. So I swapped and I have it back and I'm not gonna sell it oh, again. Very I just good. really like it. Okay, this one is called Tutsaruni, and this is a combo mm. of two different dogs mushed together in one, uh, one doggy. And this is cool because like, among other things, it, kind of the tail is the, in the center of the, of the painting, which I think is interesting. So would you like to talk about how you approach composition? Yeah, well, this one was just going to be, a, a, again, some stuff. You can see in the, maybe the legs of the dog, in the, in the, um, the things that I swiped with the spatulas. And I started working on this thing, and then I've made, I, I, I think that the dog is much that white as maybe, it may be clear yupo, I'm not sure. I mean, you know, the actual white of the yupo. But then I started having, a, I wanted to have a big piece of black, and I wanted to have a strong, simple composition. A big shape, a, a middle, middle size shape, and a, some smaller shapes. But we had recently, we, we had, we've, we've had rescue bulldogs, and we had one that was very lively and a sweet gal that was named Tootsie. So I have a good friend from high school that comes by all the time. She had this little, little dog from Ireland, it was called Rooney. So Tootsie and Rooney were playing one day when they got together and they were having fun together. And so I was making this painting and this dog thing started to happen. And so I, I kind of went with it. It isn't any kind of dog you could probably find, but <laughs> it's a kind of a combination of some dog-like thing. And I just had to have that streak going up into that black as a compositional component. So I really, really like that as a composition but it's personal to me because of the Rooney and the Tootsie thing, so I called it Tootsie Rooney. Okay, this one uh, is Orange Resolve, mm. and since we're talking about resolving paintings, um, do you have any painterly tips or tricks that you use when you're trying to resolve a painting that is just stuck or not quite there, aside from 
not letting the um, narrative yeah. guide. Put it aside for a while is the best thing to do. Go do something else or have several paintings going at the same time. That's the best thing. So that you can look around and you're, you have a mindset where maybe you've got some, uh, some um, maybe some styles or, um, I don't like the word style, but maybe you've got an approach that you're using consistently for a few days, you're into something, and maybe you've got a palette that you like, but you get stuck on different things. So I like to have uh, several paintings going, different sizes, hanging around, where I can see them, and suddenly I'll see the thing that's bothering me about this one was solved in that one. So I move something from that to this one. Um, but, but there are tricks like, uh, you know, show it to yourself in a mirror, and right away you'll see where the balance is off, especially yeah. if you're doing portraits or something. If you're doing a self-portrait, you know, you're, you see yourself the opposite of the way everybody else sees you, and you're probably gonna get, your face is crooked, but you're probably gonna get it crooked in the wrong way. So if you do that with something like a portrait or something and you're really worried about with the um, likeness, uh, then put it in the mirror and see what it looks like. The other thing is look at it up close and look at it from a great distance. So I like to have a big studio space so I can see things from a distance. Those are great tips. Um, this one, I actually don't know the name of it. Do you? Uh, well, I didn't know what to call it and I don't know what to make of it. but. <laughs> It, uh, and again, it's just a composition, one that I've fiddled with and painted over a couple of times. But I decided it's kind of, they're probably wondering why I'm looking up there. I, but I have an image on that television screen up there. I can see this. So there's this bar across it. But, oh, that's the railing. Well, there's a couple of, a couple of if you can see, there are a couple of little kind of very like star-like eyes in this thing. If you can see it as a face, a head. Um, then maybe with this great shock of hair. So I call it redhead. Oh, okay. It's the best thing I've come up with because I know now when I say that, I'll know what that painting is. All right, we're going to speed along because we've yeah. got a few left and I want to leave time for questions. Yeah. Uh, this is a heavier one. This one's called Clotilda. Yeah. And this was on Yupo. Um, and it's about the last slave ship, which was scuttled, which I think means sunk, right? Yeah scuttled in Mobile Bay in 1859 to 1860. Uh, so did you start out um, meaning to paint this or did this bubble up? Yeah, I didn't mean to paint it. I was having a good time with these shapes and it seemed to want to be a vessel. So I don't know anything about sailing or vessels or boats. Mm -hmm. And you know, being from Rustic County, all potato fields, <laughs> the best you can hope for is a lake up there. But but it seemed to want to be some kind of vessel. So I was thinking of it as a vessel with kind of sails, billowy sails and things. And then eventually I kept changing it and changing it and decided it was a weird kind of thing. I was just having fun with the grays, white and black. And I'd been reading a lot about, you know, slavery and, and, and um, prejudice and all those things in politics these days. And I happened onto this thing about scuttling that slave ship, which is, was, was supposed to be uh, banned, not supposed to be here. And, it, and the owners thought they could bring one more shipment of slaves through. So they did in Mobile Bay. And as soon as they did that, they scuttled the ship upstream, but it, it was found out later. So huh. they, they burned it and, and sunk it. Huh. But it was supposedly the last slave ship through there. So I got thinking about that. So I made some people in the hull. Yeah. And I was affected by the having gone to the museum in Washington. It was all about that very powerful museum. Let's just look at this one, shall we, for a second? Yeah. Now that we, we're taking on a journey, these are getting more abstract again. Just so beautiful. What's that called? No, no title, right? Uh, that one is called uh, Untitled 080721. Mm -hmm. So I assume no. that meant uh, the day August 7th, 2021, when you yeah. stopped. Yeah, I just like that painting very much. But I do too. I have no idea what it is. I, people see passageways and buildings and city streets and stuff. But I just see beauty. Yeah. Here's another one. Look at that. Yeah, I don't know that I have a title for that either. Uh, untitled 091322. Yeah. Yeah. Reminds me of Beverly Hills 9210. <laughs> um, yeah. Well, we're getting near the end of the interview, so do you have any improvisational advice about art or life for this audience? 
<laughs> well, of course, improvisation is great because it's freeing. So any artist who is kind of hung up on things, I think that's a, that's a great tip. And <clears throat> it's, it's possible if you don't demand of yourself some kind of, um, some kind of end. Uh, I get a good friend who was very good at, at um, plain air painting. And he said, my God, I admire what you do, but I could never do it. If I didn't know what I was doing, I would never start. And I said to him, I don't want to know what I'm doing. That's why I keep painting. And so it's, it's liberating. And, and of course, it's a cop out too. Um, but there's a great thing about that so I found in a book of children's art. A woman teacher said to a little girl, what are you painting? And she said, how will I know until I'm finished? <laughs> Which is kind of the way I do it. And another thing, my, my daughter, who's always been very creative, and whatever she thinks comes out of her mouth, she doesn't think, it just comes out. She said something to me that was very much like my painting. She's, somebody asked her, how do you come out with all this crazy stuff? And she said, I like to be as entertained by what comes out of my mouth as everybody else. <laughs> and I thought, oh my God, that's what I'm doing in paint. I like to be as surprised by what I make as anybody else. That's why I do it. David, thank you so much for spending this Great time fun. with us. Thank you. <laughs> So if anybody has a question, raise your hand and we'll... Uh, Maybe we'll see it. Yeah. Are you painting oil? What's that? Is it, are you painting with oil paint? She's asking... I, I, for years I painted with oil, but I'm painting with acrylic. The last 12 years, all these Yupo paintings are acrylic. Because it dries quickly, so I can paint over, number one. And... Um, uh, maybe that's the only reason. I, I don't like acrylic that much otherwise, but... Because I like, I like the richness of oil, and I like the fact that you can keep it going for a while. But I'm not into that now. I want to make paintings quickly, lay them aside, paint over them if I'm not crazy about them. You can't do that with oil. It takes forever for it to dry. Yes. I'm a little thrown off by the juxtaposition of improvisation, where you're just kind of letting the elements of what you're painting happen. But when you come to what might be the end or finish point or a pause, you're compelled to title it. You're compelled to look for the face. You're compelled to look for recognizable elements. And now you've just taken me back from where you started. And I can't help but feel that's RISD's fault. <laughs> and I can't help but feel commercial illustration had such a ground for you. Um, I, I was a trained commercial illustrator and I'm trying to break the rules. I'm trying to age into improvisation, but yet you also said earlier in our, our discussion or our, our conversation, excuse me, was that you said, if someone gets offended by something in my painting, I'm going to paint over it because I don't want to offend anyone. So now you're playing the audience. So. You but fortunately let's, have so many more years ahead of you, but I would love to see what you do to iron that out, because you're on the road, but it's kind of a, a push and pull going on right now. So let me just say, uh, I'll just uh, summarize, if you couldn't hear in the back, uh, that, uh, that there's this improvisational vibe, and then that's juxtaposed against um, summing things up uh, looking for a narrative to make the title, and then um, having a background in illustration uh, and design, and how that is also juxtaposed against the freedom of like free flow jazz versus, uh, yeah, th that's more or less it, I think, right? <laughs> well, first of all, I don't have that problem you pose in titling because I don't force a title. A title comes to me, or I just leave it untitled. And sometimes later on, something will come to me and I'll give it a title. But I don't f feel I need a title for a show or a, a gallery or anything like that. So that's not a burden for me. Um, but um, I'm trying to think what the other side of that was. You were thinking about how you can um, Design. put all this stuff to aside. Is that what you're saying? Right. 
you're trying to break what you've understood to be true for a fair amount of what I'm understanding your career was shaped yeah. like. Oh, you, you worried about the, my uh, censoring myself. I really don't do that very often. I can deal with a lot of fairly sexual things. I just don't want um, maybe more than one person to come to me and say, why do you have that phallic symbol in there? And I'm thinking, if that comes to you immediately, it's ruining what you can appreciate in the whole painting. So I don't want that. It's not just that it's a sexual thing. It's that they're stuck on that. If people see that so quickly, uh, they can't appreciate the painting. And I didn't realize that myself, so I might, I might change it. The other thing is, I, I'm very much against abuse, especially of women and children. So if there's, there's, if there's anything about my crazy imagination that triggers that notion in somebody else, and they say, that's what I think that's about, and if I think that's somewhat valid, I might change some little thing. But otherwise, I don't censor myself. Uh, over here. Carol Wiley, we met. Um, I hope you can hear because I can. We met in um, Rockland a long time ago when you had a show there, and I own one of your paintings. I have a black and white <laughs> painting, which I now realize could be a French policeman. <laughs> So she owns a painting uh, of David's, which could be sort of like the gendarme, the French policeman, like the black and white image we saw earlier. Yeah, and was there a question? I did miss yeah. it. Yeah, <laughs> at that opening, Harold Gard introduced you, and I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about Harold's influence on your work. So she'd like to know the influence of Harold Gard on, on David's work. Well. First of all, I loved all Harold's work, and it's, um, Harold's work was it's quite strange to a lot of people. There are strange figures, people, uh, mostly people in his, a lot of his paintings, and they're weird looking people, and they're people that look like they have problems, uh, people who are <laughs> not happy or they're, you know, troubled by something, and he names them that way sometimes. But, but more than that, Harold was always about the paint. And he always said, um, he, he didn't like to title his works. He didn't like to tell people what they're supposed to think of it. He wanted them to make their own story up when they saw it. But he was always about the paint, loved the, the way the paint went on the surface and what kind of lines he made and what kind of brush he was using and all that sort of thing. And I admired all that. That's what I liked too. Um, but, um, he also had a great saying, I'm uh, trying to think of it now. Um, he said, I don't like pretty and I don't like nice. And what he really meant was, if his painting started to look like it was well constructed and well composed and very much in certain genre or was something that was trendy, he hated that and would do something to destroy that piece, that sort of thing. And I admired that too, because what that does is it gets us to appreciate or like cliches or ordinary stuff. And this whole idea of improvisa uh, improvisation is, I could, somebody was telling me recently, why don't you paint these beautiful paintings like your friends do? You could do that. And I thought, yeah, but it's like a job and I d it wasn't any fun after a while because I know what the outcome's gonna be if I do it right. So what I want is not to know what the outcome's going to be, and that's what Harold was doing. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, my son went to RISD, and five years of instruction, trial and error for his own pleasure, um, and every medium that you know RISD offers, he's a very successful architect in San Francisco. His is so defined, so organized, so precise, that he can build buildings and shopping centers. But Marla Thomas did a song called Free to Be You and Me. I don't think you should ever be worried about seeing something or worrying about putting it together or changing it. I mean, he doesn't. Just be happy. Be, just be pleased that you have the opportunity to do what you're doing. Uh, uh, let's see if I can paraphrase that one. Uh, so, 
So uh, Dai's son um, is an architect and, and he can build buildings and it's very linear, but uh, she was thinking about uh, Marlo Thomas, is that it? Free to be you and me, that song that was uh, the, a lot of us in the 70s and 80s grew up with um, and how there's a freedom in that. Did I catch that about yeah, right? Yeah, because I thought you were trying to defend yourself and you think that you should have to. Oh, and she's saying he doesn't have to defend himself. You don't have to defend no. yourself because you're... No, no. Yeah. No, that's great. Not only being an art, but being old. <laughs> Get away with stuff. All right, last question. I see a hand up there. Do you get um, pushback from your galleries when you take work and redo it and they look for it and you say, oh, I think that it's gone? <laughs> is there pushback from the gallery, she's asking, when uh, David takes a work that was shown there and, um, and then he reworks it so it's no longer there and they're asking for it? I should be so lucky. No. <laughs> no. I, I don't. Uh, th there is such a thing. I mean, artists do get that. And um, I would get that if I were even more successful and if, if the galleries I were in were not as nice as they are. If, if I were selling stuff that seemed fairly consistent and suddenly I'm doing something else, they would not like it. Galleries look for consistency, stability, creativity, sure, they all want creativity, but they don't want to have a clientele expecting a certain thing from an artist and that artist not to be somewhat predictable. So, um, I have had things where I painted over something and a gallery or a good friend said, you knew I loved that, why did you paint over that? And the only reason was, was you never came and got it, so it's, it's fair game. You snooze, you lose. <laughs> Thank you all so much for coming and for being part of this, and we look forward to seeing you on the next Talking Art Maine. Thank you so much to David Esty. Thank you, Emily. And, uh, yeah. Thank you all for coming. Thank you. Thank you.